Well, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, that was some special music that Jeff brought up from the archives before the days of Zoom, I believe. You know, oftentimes, in my experience and the experience of others who I've spoken with, it's never been a good, particular, the best moments when someone utters these words to you. I think we need to talk. I think we need to talk. That's sometimes the case in relationships where one party or the other, or both parties reach the point where someone says, I, we, we need to talk. It sounds a little bit to me like my early teenage dating years, you know? But I heard those words a couple times, and believe me, emotionally it never ended well. And even though good things can come out of such deep and serious discussions, there may be a feeling of trepidation when you first hear those words spoken. It means someone is not happy. It means that something is going on and it's usually directed to the person to whom those words are spoken. Sometimes it means a relationship is nearing an end. Or sometimes it is like a new beginning to the relationship, a refocus, a reorganization of priorities. Now, as you can see in the screen, um, I guess to my right, I found a few funny memes on the internet that kind of capture this scenario. So in the first one, it says, what a girl is going to say when she says, we need to talk. And as you see there, uh, someone captured that, the little sliver there said, we're getting a new TV. There's a little bit of a bigger portion which says, I love you so much. But the big chunk of the pie says, we're breaking up. You can go to the next slide. This one says, I just checked your internet history and I think we need to talk. Hmm, kind of interesting right there. The next one, you can put the next one up. Oh, it says, hey, yeah, so I just Googled neuter. I think we need to talk. Well, for those who have pets, um, maybe that is kind of funny. Uh, if it is, don't forget to hit the subscribe and the like button at the bottom of the screen. I always wanted to say that because I don't have a YouTube channel. But... Those are some funny things that I saw. And those words, I think we need to talk, they're not just limited to relationships. They're not limited to just a boy meets girl situation. It could be a scenario where perhaps your boss comes to you and says we need to talk. And really, who wants to hear their doctor coming to the exam room or, worse yet, give you a call later to say, I think we need to talk. But how often, given those words, brethren, do we think and read too much into those words when we hear them? Do we think and fear what those words really mean? It could be that your boss, well, what he really wants to talk to you about is he's giving you a promotion, or maybe even a raise, or both. It could be that your doctor wants to talk to you to tell you that, oh, you know, Jeff, your blood pressure is much lower. Your blood sugar has come down to normal. And... Now, there's no sign of any disease or any cancer in your body. And I really need to talk to you to know what exactly you did. So while we think about those words coming from persons to whom we have a physical or a personal relationship, and persons that we can see, how about those words coming from the God who we cannot see? 
and yet still need to have the relationship of relationships with. If you think those words would get your attention, when God wants to get your attention, believe me, He knows how to get it. In the book of Exodus, it records the time when the law was given in Exodus chapter 20 and verses 19 to 20, I believe. It says that there were thunderings going on. There was lightning. There was smoke on the mountains. When those words, the Ten Commandments, the law was given. And what did the people do when they heard all this? They said to Moses, you know what, Moses, you speak to us. Don't let God speak to us because we will die. But Moses had to reassure them and he said, for God has not come to test you. For God, for God has come to test you. So that the fear of him may be in you to keep you from sinning. To keep you from sinning. And that indeed is what God intends for us. He says, I'm going to give you my laws. Better yet, I'm going to write them in your heart that you might not sin against me. That you learn not just to fear me, but to really follow me. For I am giving you great and precious promises. A promised land, and yet to come, a promised kingdom. So when God speaks to us, brethren, it should not be like what's recording in the book of Amos. I hope not. In Amos chapter 5, in verse 21, he says to the people there, You know what? I hate. I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Did we really just at the last feast just endure it or did we really rejoice in it? Is that something that God would say when he observed us at the feast? Did we come there with the right offering of ourselves? And I say we because I have to include myself in this discussion. Or did we have some other gods, some other priorities, some other objectives that we put in place of worshiping the true God? God told them, take away the noise of your singing. Is that how our rejoicing sounds to God? That he could see our heart and know that we weren't really in it. Let it not also be said about, to us about what was written in Matthew 15 as well. That these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Is our heart really far from the God we serve? I'll go and spend a few minutes here in the book of Psalms. There's a, a few chapters here. I want to read a few verses from there. And beginning in Psalm 81. Psalm 81. And just for reference, I like to start in verse 7 before I get down to the other verses here. Psalm 81 and verse 7, and I'll be reading from the NIV translation here, just in case you're following at home. It says, In your distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of the thunderclouds. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, while I give you stern warning. O Israel, if only you would listen to me. You shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not bow down to an alien god. I am the Lord your God. You who brought you up out of Egypt. So open your wide, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But he says to them in verse 11. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. He says, if my people would but listen to me, 
If Israel would follow my ways, he would subdue their enemies. God wants to speak to his people in a way that they can listen. I'll go to another reference here. Staying in the book of Psalms, but chapter 50 this time. Psalm chapter 50. And again, I'll start in verse 7 of Psalm chapter 50. God says again here, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, even your God. I will not reprove thee for the sacrifices or your burnt offerings. I will take no bullock out of your house, nor the goats out of their folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field, they are all mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and the field, and everything, the fullness thereof. God is telling His people that they're coming there bringing all these sacrifices, and their heart is re isn't really in it. But He's letting them know that you are offering me what I already own. What I really desire is that broken spirit, that contrite heart, which Psalm 51, 17 talks about. What I really desire are people who not just tremble at the mountain, but tremble at my word. Who really want to follow me. Psalm 95. I go to Psalm 95 as, again as well. Psalm chapter 95. And I will start here in the first verse of Psalm 95. I'm reading the Revised Standard for this one. It says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Wow, sounds like rejoicing at the feast. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it. For His hands formed the dry land. O come, it says, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Hearken not your hearts. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah. So he mentions Meribah again. Or on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who, hear, who err in their heart. They do not regard my ways. Therefore, I soar in my anger that they should not enter my rest. He encourages them today if you hear his voice. He says, let's have a talk. I got some things to tell you about what you're doing. Things that affect the relationship we have together. 
That account about Meribah is taken from Numbers chapter 20, beginning in verse 2. And it tells of that occasion when they, people were quarreling. Meribah means quarreling. They didn't have water to drink. And they complained against Moses and Aaron. But in, in truth and in fact, they were really contending with God. Was that our attitude when we come to God, that we are complaining and quarreling among each other? They said, you brought us here to die in the wilderness because we remembered all the things we had in Egypt. All the pomegranates, the grapes, and so on. And they complained, and Moses went to God, and Moses, in his anger... He went and struck the rock instead of speaking to it as God had told him. And that prevented them from going into the promised land and from him to seeing it. Did we forget when we were at the feast why we were there in the first place? Did we forget what God has really promised us? Are we learning the lessons of our forefathers in the wilderness? Or are we making the same mistakes when God indeed wants to have a talk with us? The slide there was showing the words written by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, I'll, I'll go there as well. I'll read it. But just for context, I want to go to a few verses before that. And I start in verse 2. It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the ass, the donkey, its, its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people does not understand, or do not understand. He talks about them being a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. And then drop down to verse 13, if you will, please. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13, he says here to the people, Bring no more vain offerings. Your incense is an abomination to me. Your new moons and your Sabbaths and the calling of your assemblies. God says, I cannot... Endure your iniquity along with your solemn assembly. You cannot come there and mix the two. God wants something more out of you. He wants you more focused. He doesn't want you to have these other distractions when you come and assembly and assemble before Him. He says your new moons and your appointed feasts his soul hates and they have become a burden to him. And why would that be? Unless we're coming and we're gathering and we're not doing so in the right spirit. In verse 18 it reads and he says these words Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they, be, they will be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Our God is so forgiving. He is so merciful that He will take iniquity away from us as far as east is from the west. And He's so merciful to us, even though we do not always heed 
to His Word and do His will. But we can stay in this battle, brethren. We can stay in this battle of the mind and we can do even as Timothy was instructed in 1 Timothy. Let's go to 1 Timothy in chapter 1. It says, verse 19, it says, Holding on to faith and a good conscience. We're supposed to do this. Which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. October 2020 is not the time to be running aground. There's still a lot of sailing to do. The journey to the kingdom of God is not ended for us. There is still time to turn around that ship if our conscience is not being seared. But if it is a problem for us. Let's take comfort in these words that John wrote in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20. We start in verse 20. It says, Whenever our conscience condemns us, we will be assured that God is greater than our conscience. And he knows everything. So dear friends, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we can boldly look to God and receive from him anything we ask. And we receive it because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. We have to do what pleases God even at his feast. And we have time to turn around. We're told to watch our doctrine and our life closely. Yeah, that's in 1 Timothy 4.16. But if we do that, we will save ourselves and those who hear us. Those speakers, like myself, have to do the same. We're not immune to that. But we are all looking forward to a time to come. And that time is the day of the Lord, which will usher in a kingdom, a kingdom that we long for, a kingdom that we need. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says of that day of the Lord in verse 10, it says, but the day of the Lord, it will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So it says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to? to be. You ought to live holy and godly lives. Holy and godly lives. So think about it. You're in a relationship with the God who created the universe. You're in a relationship with the God who created everything, including you, who created you in His image after his likeness, who has given you a down payment of his Holy Spirit, who has opened your mind to understand great mysteries, including that he loves you so much that he loves the church of God as a bride loves his bridegroom loves his bride. And he tells you that this physical life that we're living is not the end. He tells you also that there is a day coming when in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, however fast that is, we shall all be changed. God wants us, brethren, to be attentive 
to follow him because he wants us to give us so much, so much more than we can even think about eternal life in his kingdom. So truly, what manner of persons ought we to be? Second Peter, if you go to Second Peter, I'll just flip this over here because I think it's an interesting scripture to have. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. And I'll start in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, who was a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, he writes this to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours in the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. It says, his divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted us precious and very great promises. And through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of the passions and instead become partakers of his divine nature. So he says to them, for this very reason, make every effort then to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection. And that brotherly affection, you add love to it. For if you do these things, and you abound, they will keep you from being ineffective are unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't want us to be ineffective. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to attain to these things, to have knowledge and to have love, not just for Him, but also for those whom He has given us in our lives our brothers, brothers and sisters. The book of Hebrews is an interesting book. It tells us, an interesting fact, that God at first spoke through the prophets and so on, but he gets our attention. He speaks to us now through his son. Hebrews, I want to read a few verses from chapter 3 and possibly chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 3. As I begin winding down this message, Hebrews chapter 3, and let's start in verse. 7. And he says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion or on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked, verse 10, with that generation, and I said, they always go astray 
in their hearts. They have not known my ways. And he swore that they shall not enter his rest. Verse 15. He says again, Today, when you hear his voice, when God speaks to you, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. You who were rebellious, he wants to tell them this in verse 16, says, those who heard and yet were rebellious, was it not those who left Egypt under the leadership of Moses? And with whom was he provoked these 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? Whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter that rest? But to those who were disobedient. So see to it that they did not enter in at all because of their unbelief. Let's not be like them, brethren. We have to learn from their mistakes. We have to follow God truly. And let's go over to chapter 4. It says, Therefore, while this promise of this rest still remains, let us fear lest any of you be judged and you fail to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message which they heard did not benefit them because it did not meet with their faith to the hearers. They did not have faith in the words they heard. Do you have faith? In the words that you read, the words that God has given you. Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 11 of chapter 4. It says then to us, these are written for us, for our admonition. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Let's not be disobedient. So if God comes and says, I think we need to talk. What do you suppose God will be telling us? Could it be something that's written in the book of Revelation? I may guess about that. But as we read Hebrews, we know and we remind ourselves that God has always been speaking through time. And he says that he spoke through the prophets. He spoke through Isaiah. He spoke to Jeremiah. He spoke to Zechariah. He spoke through all the ayahs. You name them, he spoke through them. But now he speaks through his son. His son that spoke to the ancients of old. His son that came in the flesh. His son that died for us. His son who ascended on high and gave us that down payment of His Holy Spirit. His Son speaks to us through these words. And He still needs to have a talk with us. So I think He would tell us what Revelation 2 says to the churches. Revelation chapter 2 
verse 4 to 5. After he tells them, I know your works, I see it. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. So remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I'll come and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. If we've forgotten, brethren, what God has promised us, that kingdom, life eternal, then maybe it is indeed time for God to have a talk with us, to remind us of these things, to remind us of His promises, to remind us of our purpose in this life. We all have ears. So when God speaks to us through His Word, let us hear. I give you the Berkat Kohanim, which is the priestly blessing or the Aaronic blessing. Numbers Chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.